for a brilliant man. Today, Turing is generally considered to be the father of the modern computer. And there are seven academic institutions and even a ring road named after him. There have been many films, plays and plenty of TV documentaries made about him. Turing, mathematical alchemist. But for me, the real hero of the piece is Tommy Flowers. By turning Turing's dream into a reality, by building the world's first electronic programmable computer. He was the one who shortened the war. He was the one who saved those thousands of lives. And yet, had you ever heard of him? I hadn't. Mick Jagger's never financed a film about his life. There's no plaque. And the ring road round the town where he was born is called the M25. Tommy Flowers went back to his telephone exchanges. He desperately tried to get the GPO to fund further research into computing, but couldn't persuade his bosses to share his vision. After all, they didn't know what Tommy had already achieved, and of course, he wasn't allowed to tell them. Like Turing and the rest, Tommy kept his mouth shut about Colossus. Flowers was awarded a thousand pounds by a grateful nation in recognition of his war work. No one knew it barely covered the personal debt he'd run up on the first Colossus. Churchill described Turing and his colleagues as the geese that laid the golden eggs, but who never cackled. However, while all this secrecy and honour is terrifically noble, it did have catastrophic consequences. You see, after the war, Britain was in a prime position to exploit the technology, but because Colossus never existed, don't know what you're talking about, we were completely written out of the history of computing. And then the whole industry was developed by our rather less secretive, air-conditioned, centrally heated friends, the Americans. At the time, no one, not even the Americans who were romping away, realised the potential of what they were developing. Like Colossus, early attempts weren't what we would recognise as computers today. They didn't sit on your desk or play games, they did maths for the US military. The idea that computers would become an everyday machine used by non-mathematicians or civilians was not seriously entertained. Even IBM Supremo, Thomas Watson, confidently predicted, the world will probably eventually need five computers. One reason that home computing was such a big no-no was the sheer size of the machines, which was all to do with the switches. First, there were mechanical switches, then there were valves, which gave way to transistors, which in turn, in 1958, gave birth to Switch Nirvana, the silicon chip. Today, Tommy Flowers could have got his 2,000 switches, the entire Colossus machine, on this silicon chip. In fact, he could have got rather more than Colossus on it, because this chip, the brain from a modern PC, and I'm talking now only about the silver strip in the middle there, has 100 million switches. That's 50,000 Colossuses. But even though the microchip meant that computers could be small enough to take home, no one did. Because in reality, size didn't matter. If the computer was really going to change the world, it was going to have to get a lot easier to use. Enter at this point a group of groovy Californians who saw the future. In the early 70s, the Xerox Corporation founded the Palo Alto Research Center just outside San Francisco. The coolest, hippest scientists on the planet were assembled to come up with something amazing, the paperless office. And what they did come up with, and remember this was 30 years ago, was staggering. Good morning. Good morning. A screen with icons accessed by mice. That looks interesting. Let's uh, take a look at this. Floppy disks. Well, it was 30 years ago. I'm going to need a couple of copies of this. A laser printer. Oh, thank you. Laptops, email. What's the mail this morning? And of course, the web. 
push another button and the information is sent electronically to similar units around the corner or around the world. Anything else? But no one was interested. Electric post? Absurd. When I started work on a local newspaper in 1978, computers still only did things for the government. And the typing pool was still using typewriters all the way past Bucks, Fizz, Duran Duran and Bananarama. It wasn't until the mid-80s, only 20 years ago, that very slowly the realisation began to dawn that computers were going to be more than machines that did serious maths for engineers and soldiers. But in my experience, it's only been in the last 10 years that computers have spread their own brand of chaos and mental breakdown around the world. And for such a recent innovation, we really do seem to have fallen deeply and passionately in love. Today, computers are quite simply everywhere. They're on your desk, on your lap, in your palm. They work your washing machine, they play your CDs, they're in your wristwatch. In short, just about anything that uses electricity today will have a microprocessor, a computer. The average British home contains about a hundred. So instead of there being five computers in the world, there are over 17 million in the UK alone. And we've reached the point where there are plenty of things we simply couldn't do without computers. Like flying this plane. It's the Eurofighter, and even the gentlemen of the RAF couldn't fly it. If it were left to humans, Britain's first line of defence would immediately crash. The Eurofighter's onboard computer makes hundreds of tiny alterations a second to the aircraft's control surfaces, making sure that the whole thing keeps spectacularly airborne. So, you don't fly it, you just tell it where to go and what to shoot at. And that's great, so long as your instructions make sense. But in 1999, NASA's Mars Climate Orbiter was programmed using both metric and imperial units. So, after ten long months getting to Mars, the system got confused by inches here and centimetres there. The $125 million space probe ploughed into the ground, which it thought was somewhere else. And you see, that's the problem. Computers may be great at doing maths quickly, they may even appear to be clever, but they're not, you know. They're as daft as brushes. And the reason why they're so stupid is that they blindly carry out human mistakes perfectly and uncritically. Now, this stupidity should scare us to death, but it doesn't. What scares us is this. For years, we've been told that one day we'll build a computerized, emotionless cyborg that absolutely will not stop. But is this really the future? Can we ever expect to be walking with robots? At the moment, this is as scary as it gets. It's the RumbaVac, a robot vacuum cleaner, which they say is intelligent, but it's not that intelligent, is it? Because it can't even recognise when it stopped being on a rug. Watch. Look at that. I'm on, moron. Even its makers say in the handbook, which I've got here, that it may get stuck from time to time, and you don't see that in the science fiction films. Arnold Schwarzenegger's plans for world domination beaten by a cunningly placed pot plant. Get out of there and stay fashionable. For anything approaching the kind of world domination that Governor Schwarzenegger deals in, computers that run robots would require at least a modicum of intelligence. And this is what scares us. Very credible scientists out there are pushing AI as the next big thing. Even Alan Turing predicted that one day computers would have minds of their own. 
To find out whether a computer was intelligent or not, Turing devised 